All right. Uh, yeah, thank you, John. Um, I'm really happy to present the progress of my, my work, which um, involves um, the evolution of the minimal cells. So as um, a lot of you already know, probably, is that adaptive laboratory evolution is basically having a model organism and a selection pressure and then passaging the cells um, in the laboratory setting to increase the fitness of the cells um, to the specific selection pressure. And then um, in the end, you can characterize the strains uh, through whole genome sequencing or different omics measurements to, um, to be able to um, see what were the reasons for an increase in fitness. And what we are interested in is what um, we see if we do a lot of different um, replicate populations um, in the sense that we have, um, we start of course with the same population, but we do a lot of different replicates, evolve them under the exact same um, selection pressure and then see what the differences are in the end. So basically how repeatable is adaptive laboratory evolution. The second part is that we are also interested in how predictable adaptive laboratory evolution is. And for this, we want to use a constraint-based metabolic modeling approach. So I'm sure you've heard about this nice paper by Breuer et al, who did a metabolic model and used flux balance analysis. And with the help of the model, you can determine the growth rate and reaction fluxes. For our purposes, we um, want to add more constraints um, to this flux balance analysis model. And these additional constraints are nonlinear reaction kinetics. Um, basically, Michaelis Menten kinetics are used for this. And a lot of the Michaelis Menten um, parameters are actually predicted by machine learning, by a machine learning approach. We also add density constraints um, to the metabolic model and mass balance. With this uh, model, we expand what we can predict, and we can also predict metabolite and protein concentrations. Um, we are quite, um, this is something which happened rather recently. It is worked by Charles and um, a postdoc in our lab. And we actually now have our first solv solvable genome scale GBA model uh, based on the minimal cell, which is really, really nice for us. It of course has to be optimized and it is still in the first stages, but we are really excited about this. So this is like an overview of what we want to see. Um, uh, we basically have a lot of different replicates and uh, we want to see how these replicates evolve through evolutionary time. We are specifically interested in the phenotypic repeatability because the proteomic and metabolomic changes are what we can actually predict based on the model. So if we have different um, replicate strains, we want to see if we um, can see like basically fitness optima, if they are local or if there is like a more of a global fitness optimum, or if we can just see that there is no really repeatability and this basically means we have limits to repeatability. Um, so our experimental design is um, what I've already mentioned that we have a large number of replicates which uh, we grow in a robotics platform um, under continuous exponential growth because this is a nice fitness correlation. Because if you already let the cells grow to stationary phase, then the stationary phase stress would already be part of the selection pressure. Uh, we of course want to do multi-omics um, and uh, specifically we want to do it throughout the evolution because then we can actually track how the cells evolve in evolutionary time. We need a selection pressure, of course, and uh, we want to use the minimal cells as model organism. These experiments have been performed with E. coli already. Um, so um, this automatics robotics platform is optimized for E. coli that we have. However, the minimal cell has an important advantage for us, which is that it has minimal regulatory elements, which means that every change that we see during evolution, we can hopefully directly correlate to the selection pressure that we used. Also, uh, as I've mentioned, it is really good for a modeling approach because of its small size and uh, small genome size. So, um, and it has been really helpful for us in our um, growth balance analysis modeling approach. It has also been able to evolve so far. So there have been really nice papers. Um, I think John mentioned it while I was gone. Um, 
about the minimal cell being evolved in the lab. And the main questions that um, I am now focusing on is if an automation approach is possible and if a large scale experiment is possible. Because as I've mentioned, these experiments have been performed with E. coli and one disadvantage is that the cells don't really have a high optical density. However, for our experiments, we only need to know if the cells actually are still in exponential phase um, to be able to grow them in exponential phase. So when I did growth curve experiments, just like a simple growth curve, I can really see a nice, I can calculate a nice doubling time. I can still see when the cells are in exponential phase. And this is basically everything that I need to know. This is our robot system that we are using. It is in uh, the basement. It is in a room that, that is at 30 degrees. The robots produce a lot of heat. So the room is actually cooled to 30 degrees and not heated to it. It has everything that you would need for an evolution experiment. It is a semi-sterile um, room because the air is filtered. It has a plate reader, an incubator, different um, plate storages and um, a shaker. And this is the heart of the dilution, the liquid handling system. And um, the main thing that is interesting for us that it can um, suck up different volumes. So I think you can see it, that it has individually tuned um, volumes for dilution. So um, this is our workflow. We incubate the cells at 37 degrees. We read the optical density every 30 minutes for a given amount of time calculate a dilution to reach a target start OD and then dilute and repeat for um, as long as possible. <laughs> and this is what we want to see. Um, this is uh, basically growth, dilution, growth, dilution, and every time we reach sort of this target start OD. If we just simply grow the cells in the robot system, um, this is without any dilutions. As you can see, we get a nice growth curve, the same as before, and not really a change in the doubling time. So um, this is really nice for us. And um, the last thing that I'm going to talk about is our test run. I was only able to do one until now, uh, which you can see here. It looks like a lot. I'm going to go through it now. It was a 70-hour test run of 12 replicate populations. In the beginning, you can actually really see quite well the thing that we want to see with growth, dilution, growth, dilution. Each gray line represents um, one dilution that we did. So for a day, everything worked really well. And we can even shorter the transfer time or even lower the start OD. However, you can see that a lot of things went wrong after a day. And after about two days, we stop diluting and see that only three out of 12 replicates survive. And uh, we figured out what went wrong. And first of all, we see condensation because the medium is at 30 degrees and we, um, because the room is at 30 degrees, so we need to um, fix this. The high OD readings are probably air bubbles because the medium is quite um, foamy. And here you can see the, the death of the cultures. And we can actually we actually know now that these are pipetting arrows, which is unfortunate for us, but um, also quite optimistic because we know it is not because of the cells. And these pipetting arrows are probably because the pipette tips get um, cloggy because we reuse them for a day. We don't switch them after each transfer. We wash them in ethanol and water. So probably the reason for, for this is that the, the medium is clogging the pipette tips. So this is something we can also fix quite easily. So um, what's next is redo and optimize the growth and dilutions in a robot system. I hope I can still do an experiment this year, but the robot system is quite booked in, in, in our lab. So um, we are quite optimistic, actually, that we can fix all of these errors. I've been running some tests and I've been um, looking at the errors of the dilutions, but it would be really nice to have a system running where we can keep the cells in exponential phase for um, a long time. And um, meanwhile, we are also testing other growth measurements, which might make it even more easy, like uh, we would love to try a cherry. And we are trying out even a different robotics platform, which is the BioLector. The main difference is that it uses backscatter instead of um, optical density measurements, which means that uh, we measure what the cells scatter back and not what goes through. And uh, we are also trying to figure out the selection pressure 
And for this, the GPA model will be really nice for us because now we can maybe add a gene into the into the model and see if we can um, basically um, see if we can um, find a nice gene that would be interesting to look at in an, in an evolutionary perspective. So also to talk about the pyruvate dehydrogenase was very interesting for this, and it would be really nice to see if we can uh, use something like this. So with this, um, I want to acknowledge my lab in Düsseldorf and um, also our collaborators from the University in Cologne, the Bollenbach Lab and the Saints Lab, which helped me a lot to get to know the minimal cells. And I'm open for any questions or comments or, yeah, recommendations. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Leah, this is so cool. Um, so what do you anticipate finding out that is different mm -hmm. from what has already been observed by the groups at the university at Indiana University and uh, the Paulson Lab at UCSD. Yes, um, we have some main differences. Um, we the the one thing that we want to look at is also the trajectories, not only at the endpoints, but also what happens during evolution. And I think the lab in um, the Paulson lab, they did 10 replicates, which is also already a lot, but we would like to do maybe even some more replicate populations. And then we can really see uh, what the differences are between them and also what happens during evolution. And what would also be interesting is to add one more selection pressure. So to not only, um, um, not only evolve the cells um, in the in the medium and based on the genome reduction, but to maybe add one or more genes or maybe change something about the environment. Yeah, these are the main things. We already know that the Paulson lab grew the cells with shaking mm -hmm. and the Lennon Lab at Indiana University grew the cells without shaking, and mm -hmm. Lennon saw mutations in FTSZ, and Paulson's group did not. So mm -hmm. that's a simple example of a, an unexpected consequential selection pressure. What other selection pressures have you considered? Um, yes, the FTSZ one is quite interesting, I think, especially because the only difference was the shaking. Um, selection pressures that we consider at the moment are um, uh, actually the, the thing that you, um, that Sage talked about, the pyruvate dehydrogenase, would be really interesting because this is also something that is um, directly integrated in the central carbon metabolism. So it would be a really good um, thing to look at also from the modeling perspective. Um, other selection pressures which would be nice to look at are um, temperature because temperature would affect the um, enzyme kinetics, which would be a, which we would be able to incorporate in the modeling approach. And also because the lab in Cologne, which we collaborate with, they have a lot of work um, done on antibiotics. So if we could use an antibiotic which targets a specific enzyme in the central carbon metabolism or in the ribosomes, this would be also something which might be interesting to look at in the model and in the in the in the evolution experiment. Yes. <laughs> but the we are quite open at the moment. It is something we are focusing on um, until the end of the year, more in specific uh, what we want to do, actually. Other questions? Uh, I have one, Leah. Kim, Kim Weiss here. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's fascinating. I mean, the, you're going to have an extremely powerful tool to look at a number of things. Um, in terms of, the, of the, the way you set up the initial experiments, you're going to do replicas, but um, would I assume that those replicas are all going to be derived from like a single colony of, of SIN3, whichever you use, because, because otherwise, and I, I presume you'd be looking at different sets of accumulated mutations at some endpoint. Um, so, so is that the way you, you have that planned? Because 
and I'll make a general statement to the whole community. Well, no, I'll do that now. That, that <laughs> this this cell has the highest mutation rate of any known bacterium. So so um, everybody who's doing passaging of the cells in their laboratory ought, ought to remember that if they look at anything that could be mutational and, and uh, to start with clonal isolates of whatever you do. So sorry, I had to make that comment. Yeah, Leah. Yeah. Um, yes, that's a good point. Um, I've been thinking about that. Um, I think we've also talked about that some time ago. Um, for the start of the experiment, we should definitely start from a colony. Um, I've, I've said it in the beginning and I immediately regret, regretted saying we use different replicates, but of course they are from the same colony. Um, yeah, for the end, um, I, I still haven't decided yet. Um, it would be nice to have a colony, but it would also be nice to really see um, what the whole mutational spectrum of the population is. I still need to figure out what would be best. For now, I really focused on how the uh, robotics platform is possible to use for our for the cells. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Terrific talk. Other questions? I had a question. Um, very nice talk, Leah. That's that's really really cool stuff you're doing. Um, Thanks. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know much about this, but I had vaguely read that there are few, several methods, maybe using like uh, Cas genes and stuff, to sort of uh, amplify mutation in certain regions of the chromosome. So you could say uh, uh, try to accelerate the rate of mutation for a particular operon or gene. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something you'd consider trying to implement? Because then you could really focus it on FTSZ or a particular you know, pathway or something like that. No, I've actually, I, I never heard about it. You mean uh, specifically increasing the mutation rate in one mm -hmm. region? I saw a paper about this. I'm so I embarrassed. Know. I can't figure it out. I, I can dig it up and send it to you. I mm -hmm. think it was using Cas9 or something to sort of target uh, um, a particular gene and make it mutate more rapidly. Oh, I didn't know this was possible, but it sounds really interesting, actually. Yeah, that would be great if you can send it to me. I'll dig that up, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> no, because it, it would be... Send it to me as well. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, this sounds really interesting because targeting one specific region to to maybe maybe even a region that would enhance growth, maybe even like ribosomal regions or something would be quite interesting to, to see. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll see if I can dig that up then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beautiful work. Great talk. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Leah.